Hello to you, our lovely patrons, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Pubcast's prestigious pint series. Uh, raise my glass to you, you can see that. Um, today, Paul and I are chatting to two Dutchmen, Barry Overeem and Christian Verweis uh, from Holland, and they are known as the Liberators. So a lot of you will probably come across their work in one way or another over the years. They've been instrumental in bringing things like liberating structures more into the Agile world, to make uh, meetings a lot less painful, a lot more fluid. They've also authored the Zombie Scrum Survival Guide, which is quite difficult to say, um, but uh, but very easy to read. And um, <laughs> Barry himself is also a, a big contributor to the curriculum of uh, the Scrum.org uh, pathway. So our paths across a lot over the years, and, and, and I know a lot of people that I know and Paul knows, uh, have requested that we uh, we interview them for the prestigious point series. It was a really good conversation, flowed very naturally, and um, yeah, we talked a lot about liberating structures, and also, partly because I was interested in it, scientific experimentation. So uh, yeah, enjoy, and we will see you all soon for another episode. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Well, slightly earlier opening of the bar today, Paul. Very early, Jeff. It's not very early. Well, I feel guilty from. Uh, yeah. for t I do feel you know, the look I got from my wife when I took a, uh, a can of cider out of the fridge. But the technically, table. technically, we're in the Netherlands today. We're on European time. Can we we're say on that? European yeah, we, time. Yeah. yeah. So this is it's almost five o'clock. <laughs> if we're almost, round, yeah. if we're rounding up, it's five o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the sun so, is past the yard arm, as they say. <laughs> so yeah, we've got uh, we've got two guests with us today in the Netherlands. Are you both in the same part of the Netherlands, Barry, Christian? Uh, roughly, roughly. Yeah, Christian uh, lives in the city Utrecht, and I live in the the Provence Utrecht. So it's uh, it's close enough. Okay, it's only a uh, thirty minute drive uh, between us. Cool. So yeah, Barry Overeem, have I pronounced that right? Yeah. Yeah, and Christian what, what, Perfect. Perfect. Very good, Jeff. Very good. Very good. Yeah. You're very Dutch. That's good. Well, I, I do I do practice the Dutch accent a lot at home, but so I won't do that online. <laughs> <laughs> so um what what can we get you to drink, gentlemen? Oh yeah. So like I already <laughs> told you, um, this is very boring. It's like uh it's, it's a, a pint of water or it's, a, it, it's not vodka is it I was gonna, it looks like vodka but I'm, yeah no, no either is, way no. whatever is in there we don't judge we're a non-judgmental uh social distance in uh, and christian yeah i'll have a ginger beer actually i got one that says that it's from england but i think that's just the marketing department that decided that but it, it's it's a good ginger beer so very good very i good. do like Paul? beer but this is different for once that's all right i've gone um I've gone fairly uh, standard uh, stock cider today, Jeff. First one I pulled out the fridge, a can of Stoford Press. Yeah, the old, the old faithful. Oh, I do like a can, I do like a Stoford. Um, served in my local pub, Herefordshire cider. Tastes like apples, Jeff. Well, okay. Well, I'm I'm not going standard. Oh, I'm going for homemade. The engineer's dark side. <laughs> Well, that sounds really good. Yeah, this is a home brew. It's a 6% dark ale. Oh, wow. Made by myself. Hope I haven't opened it yet. This is the first one I've opened. So yeah, it didn't explode. That's a good start. Um, I'll pour it so you can I'm see. I'm very curious to hear what it tastes like. It's very, very dark. dark. Very oh, dark. Oh, wow. It is. It's like stout. Yes. So this, well, it looks like it. It shouldn't taste like it, but we'll see. It's with, uh, it's got Bodicea hops in it, but it, it should be dark it should have some kind of vanilla flavor apparently but we'll see Ooh. it does have a slight sweet <laughs> we're all it. jealous now for not being <laughs> <it>. <laughs> mm. yeah it's nothing like a stout it's room temperature obviously that's, that's why i've kept it but um it is it's 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 quite um it has a te sort of texture of a, an ale rather than a stout it's not very thick um and yeah it has a little bit of a, a a nice woody taste to it and it doesn't taste six percent so that'll That's, go that'll go quite nicely yeah mm. 
Yeah. So do you follow a recipe with this stuff, Jeff, or are you, are you kind of making it up as you go along? Both. So I, I haven't yet got into making my own malts. So right. I will I will get my own malt from uh, a shop, but I will mess around with um, with hops. Okay. Uh, right. And I try different sugars as well. So this I actually put um, uh, brown sugar in rather than uh, white uh, glucose. Yeah. Uh, mainly because I lost the glucose. Uh, I don't know where it went. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of a, a, an innovation, improvisation through necessity. But yeah, it worked, it worked absolutely fine. So that's that's nice. I was a little bit. I, I didn't know how this one was going to turn out. So oh, I'm pleased wow. with that. Mm -hmm. there and, and where can I or listeners get it if, if we want to order it? Is it available somewhere? Well, I don't have a license to sell. Mm alcohol so i can't do that mm. um, but i have been known to give out gifts to people right. um so you never know with christmas coming up so christian uh, given your enthusiasm out about beer is is brewing your own beer on your bucket list as well or i would love to but i don't you have to be super clean and i always respect people who are able to pull it off especially as a, a beer like you just described jeff from what i've heard that's very hard to to get right taste wise so i would love to but too hard for me i think i'm not clean enough for it mm. <laughs> sterilizing agent is, is do you, did you underestimate how much sterilizer you need <laughs> like buckets yeah. full <laughs> yeah you have to, and you have to keep cleaning stuff don't you everything yeah. has to be spotless doesn't it yeah I, I know what you mean yeah so that's whenever i go into the uh the local shop that sells the the homebrew kits he always says and have you got enough sterilizer <laughs> <laughs> something he says every time to everybody uh, I've, I've currently got two buckets of the stuff but yeah it's it's nice to be clean but um especially if you're going to be offering it to other people sure yeah but I would, I'd encourage you to give it a go. I think it's a, it's a good, especially if you're, you're doing it yourself. It's a, it's a it's an inspect and adapt thing, right? It's, mm, it is. Try yeah. it. Yeah, I, I'm, I may dabble with it at one point because I a lot of friends of mine are doing it too. So another thing I've been experimenting with recently, actually, but I don't know whether this translates Scotch eggs. What is that? What is a what Scotch is a Scotch egg? egg? Paul knows what Scotch egg. It's in England. It's yeah. quite a good pub snack, really. Basically, it's a it's a boiled egg, mm -hmm. and then there's a coating of sausage meat. And then a coating of breadcrumbs. Oh wow! Which, which is deep fried, I believe, isn't it? And it is deep fried, but then baked as well. So I've been experimenting with this. So I've, I've made some chorizo scotch eggs, and I've been using different types of breadcrumbs, panko breadcrumbs, and things. Just just trying lots of different things and experimenting and getting some feedback. And yeah, I get the impression, Jeff, you're actually running a running a pub, and you're just yeah. not telling me you've, you've diversified, and you're actually that that shed that you're in now is actually a a fully licensed bar. Well, probably. I think it's good to have options. <laughs> oh, so yeah. smart. diversify your portfolio but we should we should probably introduce properly we should introduce our guests barry and christian who we will we will explore why but uh, are known as the liberators um from holland the netherlands uh, dutchland as paul calls it um, <laughs> no i don't <laughs> Just make it up uh and yeah so i've known barry for a while christian for not quite as long um through various means of uh, the, the liberating structures that they promote, the zombie some survival guide, what used to be called the Scrum um, the Scrum Team Survey, but it's now called something else, or have I got that the wrong way around? It, it's yeah, now called, yeah. yeah, it's now the Scrum Team Survey, and it was the, the Zombie Scrum Survey, yeah. Got you. Um, and also, Barry and I collaborated a few years ago with regards to uh, curriculum between Scrum Alliance and Scrum.org around the advanced trauma master certification. So we've known each other for quite a while, but um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're super glad to be here. It's a pleasure. And I guess that, that would be a good place to start. Why do you call yourself the Liberators? <laughs> oh, you Barry, start, you came up with the name, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. a great name, but it's I, I, it was very hard to come up with a name and Barry had it all of a sudden. Yeah, we, we did it one wanted to have something boring like this this cliche uh, name. Uh, so we're looking for something that already sets the expectations, sets the tone about if an organization or a team starts to collaborate with us, what they can expect. Um, I think the liberator. Some I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it also describes what we want to achieve, like liberate teams, liberate uh, organizations from outdated modes of uh, of working, outdated modes of uh, of collaborating with uh, with each other. Um, and, and liberate them in such a way that they uh, can unleash their superpowers. And we believe that each team has 
superpowers that need to be brought to the surface. And for some teams, the, it's quite easy. The, you just need to scratch the surface and you'll see uh, superpowers appear. Well, and some teams, you need to do uh, a bit more work. <laughs> they were able to, uh, to hide them quite well. And how long have you and Christian been working together? How long has, has this partnership been, uh, been in place? I think, Chris, four years now, four or five years. Yeah, and we started the Liberators three years ago. So uh, and a year before that, we were just working together as freelancers. Um, Barry started as a freelancer. I'd already been freelancing for a few years, and we sort of connected because we have a similar style of writing. I think we connected mostly on the writing, on the blogging. Uh, and, and from there on, we started working together. It was a lot of fun. And it still yeah. is, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Important to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so teams need liberate. Are they are they prisoners then? Are teams captive in in your experience more often than not? I think we we both think so, and I won't say most teams, but sometimes well, what we always like to do is when we enter an organization or visit it or talk to people from an organization, sort of to get a sense of what are the the things that you're smelling when when you go into the office building or into mm. the team room. Um, and that's that's not literal, right? Because we've used the term scrum smells before. That those things to, that just don't seem quite right. But you're not actually talking about what hang things actually smell, right? No, 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 not not literal smells, but more like what are the <laughs> cultural smells or the things that people say or the sense that you're getting of being yeah. somewhere. And one thing we've both noticed is that there are so many organizations where you have all these smells that radiate low autonomy. People don't feel like they control anything, like they own anything they're just doing what they're told and well for barry and me our background has always been that we worked for organizations where we had a lot of control and a lot of autonomy and in a sense we do want to help those teams experience that same level of autonomy as, as we've done in the past yeah um, so yeah i think we want to liberate teams and many teams can use some help there and well chris the I, I do recall an experience that we had at an organization whose name i will not uh, in this <laughs> session but when we entered the building they gave us a i'm not sure what the name is something to remove oh. dust yeah uh, um, a duster a duster yeah a duster yeah yeah and, and it was uh, the the department that uh, gave it to us because it was more like a symbol that they um, wanted to have every employee a duster so they so they could uh, <laughs> revitalize their own organization okay um, that, like that was an interesting clean. experience for us <laughs> like okay there's some work to do over there i'm sure it was baz vodder that um used to put on his business card something like agile janitor or something mm. like that wasn't it mm. wasn't he? yeah i'm sure it was baz that used to say that yeah. You got a lot of similar smells. Like I re also remember the company with all the dead flowers everywhere, you know, and oh, all no. the, in the team room and the, the the welcome area. There were all these dead plants, and that's always sort of <laughs> it's just a small thing, but it's still something that you notice. Mm. Can't keep ba basic things alive. Yeah, it doesn't tell you something. Yeah, I think so. So what what was the connection with the liberators? Was it accidental with the liberating structures, or was that deliberate? Barry, you want to take this one or shall I do it? Yeah, but, but I'm actually not sure if it was accidental. I think it was accidental. Um, but I think we were quite happy that once we came up with the name The Liberators, yeah. um, at that time, we already uh, used liberating structures. Yeah, I think it was more like an extra uh, benefit that it's quite easy that um, um, yeah, the connection with uh, liberating structures is easy to make. Um, and sometimes it's... people approach us because they think that we mm -hmm. created liberating structures. I think sometimes we have done a bit too much promotion and created <laughs> too much content about liberating structures. But yeah. just to also to clarify that one, we did not. Um, Henry Lepmanovic and Keith McCandles, those two awesome people, they co-created and co-developed uh, liberating structures. And we're just uh, two humble guys from the Netherlands that learned a lot from them and are just very passionate and enthusiastic about it. Yeah. So did, have you, I, have you what, worked I, with them? We have, yeah. We we with we still do, by the way, which is incredibly awesome because Keith and Henry have so much experience, and it's always a pleasure to talk with them and to, to chat with them. We've done immersion workshops with them, like about liberating structures, but also we hang out with them every now and then on Zoom. More with Henry at the moment, but with Keith also every now and then. It's always a, a lot of fun. 
but yeah, I think the name was accident. Sort of the connection with the name was accidental, but it was also because we were doing a lot with liberating structures at the time. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's all it's sometimes a bit confusing for people to be honest. So <laughs> no, I, th I think it's very good. I think um, that was that was I certainly put those two together straight away. Thinking when I think of for right or for wrong reasons, I, when I when I hear about liberating structures structures, and I generally make that association with the two of you straight away, which is which is obviously great working well so yeah keep doing it what are keith and henry's backgrounds it's not they're not they're not agile people are they? Where, where, where do they come from uh keith has a lot of has a background in complex complexity science i think he was part of the plexus institute in the united states that's also by the way where he met henry and the plexus institute is specialized in complexity science so a lot of people in that field were part of that institute or working for it um, and Henry Limanovich was one of the, I think he was a VP for, um, what's it called, a big pharmaceutical in the United States, but I uh, the name. Yeah. Merck. Yeah, he oh. was a VP for Merck. Um, and um, he actually discovered, he, he noticed there that every time there was a meeting, it lacked energy, people were not engaged. And he wanted to change it, but he didn't know how. And that's when Keith and Henry met. And Keith was already working with this idea for liberating structures. And Henry thought, let's try it at Merck. And that's what they did, I think, 30 years ago or 25 years ago. And from there, they actually started developing liberating structures. So there's quite a rich history, actually, of, okay. of both yeah. those two, but also liberating structures. So it's also interesting that within the Plexus Institute, um, that's also where the Kinefin framework um, was developed, so to okay. say. Um, so it's all connected in a way. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So, but but Henry and Keith have zero background with Agile, with a Scrum. And when Chris and I met them, they were pretty uh, overwhelmed with that there's this entire community out there as well. <laughs> and we, I think what Chris and I did, and also, of course, not, not only us, but uh, also other people, people, is that made the connection with yeah. uh, Scrum and liberating structures, because we think that the connection uh, makes a lot of sense and that you can get uh, way more efficient with Scrum and um, all the Scrum events, etc., if you connect them with liberating structures. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I haven't studied the um, the evolution of it, but it has evolved, right? There, the, these practices, the thirty-three or foot, however many there are at the moment, they've evolved over time. And I, my my instinct tells me that it's been a kind of a a symbiotic relationship, the agile world and the liberating structures world, because you see things like open space in there, you see things like effectively, um, uh, effectively pairing in there, right? The Troika consult, that, that kind of thing. Uh, one, two, four, these things, I don't think they've necessarily come from one space or another. It's been a, I don't know, that emergence. So at the risk of um, slowing down a bit, Jeff, mm -hmm. apologies for okay. that. Is it worth for maybe some of our listeners that perhaps haven't heard of liberating structures before? Um, Barry, um, I know Christian. Can you give us a brief kind of synopsis? What are, cool. what is what is a liberating structure, sure. and how would what would it be used for? Well, Chris, this is something that you can do because I'm terrible at explaining <laughs> liberating structures. I think that's also the most difficult thing. So if, if Christian is going to pull him off, then I have huge respect for him uh, because liberating structures really is something that you should experience. Okay. It's like talking about liberating structures is about. Uh, Jeff showing um, his his beer, and then you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay, tastes very good. Oh, so Chris, yes, yeah. Go. Well, you, you set the expectations. Um, well, I think we always like to describe liberating structures as the antidote to what you normally see when you put a group of people together in an in a in a meeting room. Normally, you have people sitting around the table, and then one person talks for a very long time. Everyone else listens, or not even. Uh, and then another person starts talking for a very long time, but you don't hear anyone else talking during the meeting. Um, and liberating structures are, are very simple alternative ways of organizing interactions between a group of people in such a way that all their voices can actually be included in the conversation. And um, there are many liberating structures, 33 in total, and each structure does this in a different way, but with a very specific purpose. So, for example, you have the liberating structure one, two, for all. And Barry, would you be able to explain the steps of one, two, for all? Because then we can sort of explain it together. Yeah, sure. yeah so one, two, for all is one of the basic uh, foundational uh, liberating structures. Um, its simplicity is also its uh, strength, uh, because a one, two, for all is 
uh, one is one minute individually. So you give a group of people an invitation, uh, something to think about, and then they okay. take one minute individually to get their thinking started. Um, afterwards, they form pairs. And then as a pair, they have a conversation um, about the same invitation for two minutes. And then that pair uh, goes on a double date and forms a group of four. And then as a, a group of four, they develop new ideas together. And then the old part, that's the part where if necessary, then can then they can share some some of the 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 insights that stand out the most with the group as a whole. So you really scale up um conversations um in such a way, but in such a way that everyone has had time to contribute uh, and to get their own thinking started as well. Mm -hmm. And what you could do is sometimes we explain liberating individual liberating structures as um, Lego bricks. So one liberating structure is a is a Lego brick, and one Lego brick is already pretty cool. But the real magic happens when you start connecting all these Lego bricks to each other, and then the possibilities are are endless. So the real uh, strength of liberating structures becomes visible when you start creating strings of liberating structures. Got it. Okay. So for the, the the meeting the workshop the gathering your birthday party whatever take something in mind um mm. try to identify the purpose that you want to achieve with it and then start playing with all these lego bricks aka liberating structures um, and try to create a string by which you can achieve that purpose and that's very cool and that's Good. became sort of the hobby of christian and, and myself as well and have you each got a favorite? Uh, like I've got 33 favorites. Yeah. Is that, is that okay? <laughs> no, you wouldn't, no, you no, wouldn't no, let sorry. a product owner get away with that, would you? You wouldn't let a no, product I've owner get away with that. I've got a couple of them. Um, shall I start, Chris? For this sure, one? go ahead. Uh, let me think. Critical uncertainties, without any doubt. So critical uncertainties is about uh, strategy making, um, creating strategies together uh, with the entire group um and maybe to make a connection with uh, scrum you can use critical uncertainties to create product to create a product strategy and then not one strategy but based on critical and uncertain things that might happen you create multiple strategies so that if one of these uh, scenarios becomes a reality then you already prepared yourself uh, for that happening and then everyone knows what to do um that's it you're only getting one yeah you only got <laughs> oh, one there. Yeah. i agree <laughs> okay that's it yeah, yeah my Chris. favorite would be appreciative interviews um it's a very simple structure basically everyone finds another partner and they 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 share a success story of something that went really well uh for them personally with one other person that other person then gets time to also share their story but you also, they also have to listen carefully to each other and make some notes about what was that success story and what made it possible. Because in the next round, they actually have to retell the success story of their partner to two other people from another pair that joins them. And then in that group of four, the question is, if you've listened to all these success stories retold by the partners, what are the factors that are common to all of those stories? And how can we invest as a group in those factors right here, right now? to make more of those successes possible. And I think that there's just so much good positive psychology going on in that structure. It's also one of those things you have to experience appreciative interviews to see how well it works. People are always smiling. Mm. It feels very good to share a success story. It feels even better to hear someone retell your story in their words. Uh, everyone's always a bit nervous. Did I say all the right things? Did I repeat it correctly, but everyone's always very positive and the insights that come out of this are always useful. It's a very powerful one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you and think, do you think, um, some of these, um, can be some, some of these are more deliberate than others. And what, what I mean by that is that some, some might be more formally facilitated, but some of those liberating structures can, you can almost weave in without people appre appreciating what you're doing. Is that, is that fair? I think so. Yeah, I think that, well, I, don't, I wouldn't say necessarily that they're not all of them are just as deliberate because all, all structures have a very clear purpose. Okay. But what we like to do, Barry and I, and we didn't do this initially, is 
you can do liberating structures without even mentioning it, without yeah. even saying what you're doing right now. Okay. Of course, you have to facilitate it, but you can still do appreciative interviews without mentioning that that's what you're doing. And I think that that makes it even more powerful. Mm. Um, we did a lot of that in the past where we actually explained we're going to do liberating structures, we're going to do this and that. But that can also create resistance in groups that are like, why should we do all these things? What is What are all these fancy words that you're using all of a sudden? Right. So that's that's my experience. And Barry, yeah. I, I'm curious, what, what do you think of this? Yeah, liberating structures should never be about liberating structures themselves. Um, so I think the only time when we do mention it is during these liberating structures immersion workshops, uh, because that's the purpose of, the, of those workshops. Um, but otherwise, we don't really emphasize it. It's more like let people just experience a liberating structure. And if they're curious about what just happened, then we might give a brief explanation about the structure that we've used. Yeah. Uh, but the pitfall is always to um, to emphasize it too much and also to be too strict in time boxing and explaining the steps, etc. It should be more like um, help the group Natural. just work just naturally, flow. certain yeah. flow. Um, and, and we had a conversation yesterday, Barry, didn't we, on a similar yeah. vein, just about Scrum in general, Agile in general. Just it, it's you don't need to mention Scrum, you don't need to mention Agile, any of those tools. You just do some stuff in yeah. a facilitative way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and it's going, like, like you said, Chris, it's going to be less resistance. There's less need to worry about. Oh, this is a thing. This is a this is a mm -hmm. technique that someone's trying to. No, 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 no. We're just we're just going to have a facilitate this. That's that's, sure. that's yeah. what it is. And then it works. Yeah. May I ask, Joff and Paul, what is your experience? What, what did you experience when you participated in a liberating structure? What was it like for you? Well, so it's funny. So I was saying to Paul um, only recently that so liberating structures is something that we came across when we did a lot of research into facilitation and collaboration um, quite a long time ago. And it was something that was one of those things that came in and probably little bits of it seeded into things that we did. And then we probably didn't pay enough detailed attention to a lot of the stuff and then it came back into our conscience um, so things like one two four all things like fishbowl um things like that the, the trucker consulted they, they formed part of our facilitation without us really probably if i'm being honest giving the credit where it was due um but i, I if i was to so this actually wasn't your question was it but i, I think it was only fair seeing as i asked you your favorite what my favorite would be i think my favorite would be 15 percent solutions mm -hmm. i think the part of Scrum that I was brought up on that doesn't really seem to get spoken about enough, in my opinion, these days, is the art of the possible. So I was always taught that is effectively what Scrum is, is the art of the possible. I know inspecting the DAP loop and things like that, but for me, it, don't get caught up in what things should be. Focus on what things could be. Um, and that fits very nicely with the other world that I operate in in professional coaching, which is just make some progress. Forget about the things that you can't control focus on what you can control right yeah 85 yeah, percent of it fine you you can't affect that all right but you can affect the 15 so That's let's cool. focus on that mm -hmm. um, and i think it works for product owners i think it works for development teams i think it works for scrum masters i think it works for leaders anyone involved i think just that 15 percent just gets that momentum that ball rolling hmm. i like that i like that a lot and i fully agree with it 15 percent solutions is awesome and we almost always do it at the end or even halfway when we do a workshop with teams it's perfect yeah, yeah. Maybe one thing to mention, and then uh, um, Paul, I'm going to give it to you. Um, yeah. So one thing to mention, that's also the hope that Christian and I have. And I think Christian actually wrote a blog post about it, um, which is called, top of my mind, um, liberating structures are not techniques for facilitators, but for users, something like that. Um, my hope is, and that's also a pitfall that we see, is that liberating structures are being perceived as uh, something for facilitators and trainers and uh, things that you only use during training and workshops and that's it while the intention is that everywhere where two more than two or three people collaborate with each other interact with each other they benefit from using liberating structures mm -hmm. so just in regular day-to-day -day conversations you can already use impromptu networking you can already use one to for all etc um so yeah my encouragement especially to people listening to this one is just think about any kind of conversation that you'll have today tomorrow next week and just try one or two liberating structures and just go for the basic ones 
Hmm. Because, yeah, I'm quite sure that once you've tried the basic ones, you'll be addicted as well, and then you'll start exploring the other ones. I think a lot of people actually find that they've used some of them already, or, or certainly been involved with some of them. They're, they're not, they're not crazy magic. No, uh, not at all. Dark magic or anything like that. They're, they're, they're relatively normal ways yeah. of working. Yeah. Yeah, they're simple. They're also intended to be so simple that anyone can use them. You don't need to get a license for it or a certificate or go to a very advanced training of any kind. You just read the website. It helps if you experience it once or twice with other people, and then you can do it. Maybe not the super, di the more difficult ones like critical uncertainties that needs some practice, but it's still not incredibly hard to do. So it's easy, just give it a try. Yeah. And for you, Paul, what what was your favourite one? Yeah, well, I think like like Jeff said, we've kind of riffed on um, a few of these in the past, probably without giving them their, their full their credit where credit's due. But I'd probably say the um, the what so what now what I think is probably mm. that's that's um, and we've used that as a debrief quite a lot in our exercises that and I know that and it always goes down well because it's it's like you say it's just so simple it just it's really easy to introduce. And it's really easy to do debrief because they're just three simple questions. Um, and the other one, I, which again, I've always experimented with the five wise, but I like the idea of it's nine wise, isn't it? But basically you go that stage further again, you keep, which can be extremely uh, frustrating <laughs> for people that you're, <laughs> you're asking those questions to. Yeah. But yeah, you're basically imitating a small six year old uh, child and just keep asking yeah. why until, until you get the answer, until you get reached the bottom. Yeah, so yeah, they're, they're probably the ones that I use the most often, I think. Really fair that you were able to pick to, to choose two. <laughs> <laughs> yes, see, yes, yeah, so I'm just a bad product owner. Uh, okay, it's fine. <laughs> well, it, it's nice that you mentioned product owners. Well, it makes a lot of sense with the both of you, but especially for product owners, they're so useful to do with stakeholders. Mm. And it's it's not happening nearly as much as we hope it would be because what we are seeing, and, and maybe you have a different perception, but it's mostly scrum masters doing it, sort of the, in a way, the facilitators. But I would love to see far more product owners do something with liberating structures. And mm. yeah, all, all the power to them. That would be yeah. great. Use min specs to have a critical look at your product backlog and uh, see yeah. what's left after you've used min specs. Yeah. Why do you think that is? What in, in terms of the exposure is it mainly like you said, Barry? Because it's been seen as this facilitation toolkit. Is it? Does it need to be? Do we need to change our our tack with that? Do we need to push it in a different direction to get more product owners involved? Do you think? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm not sure actually why why that is. It could also just be because in general maybe scrum masters, agile coaches, facilitators might be just I don't know more. For them, it might be more convenient to try this kind of stuff. Um, it could also be that product owners are interested, but then they give their scrum master a call and say, "Hey, have a look at this and let <laughs> yeah. me know if it's uh, yeah, if yeah. it's uh, read, read like. that and let me know if it applies." Yeah. I have a theory. Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. And and that is that. So since the, the role of the scrum master was was brought in, facilitation was ex an explicit part of the role. Um, but the product owner has always been associated with product management that word management and one of the critical uh, parts of a job description for product managers and I think it's also been adopted large well, largely for product owners as well is stakeholder management that term stakeholder management but when I'm coaching product owners I don't talk about stakeholder management as such I talk about stakeholder facilitation and I think that that mm -hmm. difference of emphasis is important because the, so the scrum master is facilitating people because they don't have authority now the product owner has some level of authority but quite often they don't have authority over the stakeholders they need to facilitate them and, and that phrase you know um herding chickens is is or herding cats mm -hmm. is is that it's, it's chaos right and that, that those facilitation skills to be able to and a lot of these techniques as you said chris will help massively in facilitating that group um that's my theory anyway mm. Yeah, there is a package going to be delivered in a minute, by the way. So I have to zoom out and open the door. So, <laughs> so I'll mute for a moment and be back in a minute. No worries. I'm, I'm just going to Google that that well-known phrase, herding chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> well, that will uh, make the bloopers real, Jeff. Yes, Don't yes. That. So now we have two <laughs> minutes to talk about Chris. So. Well. <laughs> oh, yeah. we You can tell us yeah. all, the, all the secrets now. Well, one of the... Um, one of the interesting conversations that we have with people in this series is, is um, inspirations. So uh, we, 
we we started this track really in in response to the fact that it was 20 years since the agile manifesto and you know how 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 things have progressed over the last 20 years since that event and the people that we've been talking to that we've considered in in various different ways to be inspirations to us but also largely the community um how how have you seen well i guess there's two questions so i'll prioritize first of all who are your inspirations as you were as you were getting involved in the agile world and over the last 20 years or so mm. well i shall i go first chris sure go ahead um so i, I think i'm going to mention henry and keith once more um but from a difference for a different reason i think they when i had a conversation with them a couple of years ago they mentioned that they moved into the direction of, of developing liberating structures because they were a bit tired about all these frameworks and methodologies that were going on, also in their uh, field of work. Um, and that's something uh, something that I could really relate to because liberating structures doesn't tell you anything about what framework or methodology to use. Um, and um, I'm still enthusiastic about Scrum. I'm connected to Scrum.org as a Scrum trainer, I do quite a lot of work with Scrum. But for me, it's never about Scrum. Um, so I use Scrum from an agnostic perspective as well. Um, so you probably will hardly ever hear me talk about Scrum from a theoretical point of view, because that's quite boring. You can read it in a Scrum guide and then you'll just end up in a theoretical discussion that sounds interesting but it's pretty useless um so i always try to uh, stay away from that from scrum as a framework and more on a deeper level talk about empiricism how it ties back to complexity how it can help you with product delivery um and whenever we talk about kanban agile extreme programming lean well that's all fine by me but again i'm also trying not to talk about kanban itself but again so what does it make possible so for me the inspiration was to um, have a confirmation in what I already had in mind and just to strengthen it. Um, yeah. Hmm. That's such a good answer. Can <laughs> only plus one that, by the way. Um, I, I would have also said Henry and Keith, maybe even more Henry because he's a bit older. He's in, he's really a senior citizen. I don't know his actual age in the, into the eighties or end seventies, but the way he's, he is still engaging with, with professionals like us that's just incredible i want if when i have that age i want to do that too you know just to be so engaged still with 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 your work and what it makes possible um but also a lot of the people that inspired me when i started with scrum were not so much thought leaders or 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 anything but more like for example the owner of the company where i worked at the time who was willing to give the teams that i was also a part of a large degree of autonomy to make their own decisions which was risky because the products we were creating were quite, it was important that they were of high quality, but he still gave us autonomy. And I think that that's still an inspiration to me in how you can lead a company and how 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 different leadership often looks like in most companies. I, I'm, I'm very spoiled in a sense by having worked for a company where I saw a good example of this. But for me, the, the entrepreneurs, the business owners that do that, that make those kinds of decisions, they are still very inspirational to me even now. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really good point. I, I, I want to amplify that if I can, because it's, it's, it is it is easy for us as trainers, coaches, podcasters, whatever we consider ourselves to be, to, to say, you know, if you're running a business, then give your teams autonomy. You know, mm -hmm. inspect, make mistakes, you know, try something, get to market, fail, fa we can say all that stuff. But actually when your money's on the line, when you're, you know, you're a director of a company, you've got customers, this is your baby, this is your life, actually, doing that, taking that gamble, trusting those people and giving those people the space to, to be themselves. And, 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 and that, that is, that is tough. And, and that will inspire more people deeper than any thought leader, like you say, or, or author or signatory of the manifesto, not to put them down at all, but the people are actually doing the business. I think that is a exactly. massive point. Yeah. That have skin in the game if it goes wrong. And thought leaders can still contribute a hell of a lot to our community but sometimes it's easy to say something that sounds good but you don't have any skin in the game yeah but these are the people that are investing their money and sometimes their own money and mm -hmm. I, I think that that's and and barry, barry barry you also worked for a company where that was the case right yeah 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 it was the same and also again uh, luckily a positive experience where 
I started experimenting with Scrum at a web agency. I think it's already like eight, nine years ago. Um, but I, that organization also made the jump towards uh, autonomous teams. Um, and I was also able to see like the impact on, on the owner and, and, and what, it's, what kind of courage it took to make that decision. Um, and especially just to let go of control. Um, because like you said, yeah, it's, it's for us, it's quite easy to say just to, just do it because I read in a lot of articles that it seems to be a good idea. So let's just give it, give it a try. But if it's your own company and, and um, it can also, yeah, it can become a success, but it can also go the other way around. Hmm. Um, but luckily, yeah, I've also had more positive than negative experiences on that, uh, on that area. Where do you see it? The next, what's the next step? What's the, do you think is the next leap within an agile? within the agile industry where where do we need to go next where do we need to focus oh, no, i can make a very uh, poor connection to the scrum team survey like the entire <laughs> world <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, is that okay uh, if we, if we you have data about... right yeah yeah what's your but... data telling you I mean, Chris, yeah. can you talk about well, that a bit of like the research well maybe not maybe maybe just a step back is that our our hope for where our, we are going with our community is to be more evidence based to whenever we decide to do something like apply a certain practice or even implement scrum or something else look at the evidence what does the evidence actually say when we talk about fluid teams what does the evidence actually say i think what in our community a lot of the things we do are informed by opinion are informed by what thought leaders say which can be very true, but it can also be not true and it can also cause damage. And I think that what would be really good is if in our community, we use more existing evidence, scientific evidence, data, evidence from data, and also evidence from personal experience, but that should be just one part of it. And that would be perfect and awesome. And I think that that's what we're trying to do also in a small part with the Scrum Team survey. Well, that, I'm glad you brought that up because I know you've got a big passion for that. And it's something that Paul and I, we touched on in a podcast quite a while ago when we were in Dublin, Paul. I, don't know, I can remember this one because it's something I've always wanted to come back to. Probably because it was in Dublin. Well, oh, it, it was another dark <laughs> ale. Um, but yeah, it was um, no, the, just the idea that as a community, as an industry, we need to become a lot more properly scientific, you know, a lot more diligent and, and um careful and mindful about the experiments you run because you said about yeah it may well be um opinions that form our decisions but also we things that we see as facts but actually mm -hmm. are, are influenced by our cognitive biases or things that we want to see mm. we're, we're so good at deluding ourselves as human beings and seeing what we think should be there or expect to be there and if we hold something as passionately as as a lot of us do in this industry you know we believe that self-organizing teams are the right thing to do well then we will see evidence for that and we will filter our evidence against that but in what conditions mm -hmm. um it, i think it's really we do need to get a lot better at that i think that's a really good point the confirmation bias it's so easy to fall into <laughs> um and and we fall into it all the time too but Fortunately, there is a lot of research that we can rely on. There is a whole lot of scientific research into agile teams, into scrum teams, into different practices. But for some reason, our community and the academic community that are both working on this area, they don't know how to find each other. Uh, and there are connections being made, fortunately, but they're still far and few between. So it would be great if we have way more of this. In order for us to do that, we one of the things that I've seen, I tend to find either you get a, a lot of data that says positive things or a lot of data that says negative things. And trying to get get the two perspectives together and being able to you know rationally and objectively evaluate the different perspectives, not hear two sides of the story, which is often what's put, but ra rationally, objectively evaluate all aspects of situations mm -hmm. and try and take the emotion out of it as much as possible look for patterns look for connections but also strip out you know what appears to be a uh, cor correlation but it, you know, or, or causality but actually isn't mm -hmm. um, that we talk about it but i don't think we've got the skills in the industry the discipline the rigor mm -hmm. i agree not yet <laughs> i hope that's going to change <laughs> And, and we can work on this, the four of us and, and others who are listening to this can work on this too. But yeah, totally agree with that. Yeah. And maybe just one extra hope 
that I have. It's more like a yes and. So mm -hmm. yes and more evidence-based um, work that we're doing and also a better connection with, with the science that's available. It may be new research that we can do. An extra hope is that it also results in um, uh, practices, experiments, strategies that the teams themselves can use to, to create an environment where they can be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so that the teams are put in a position that they have the self-managing capabilities to do something mm -hmm. with the, re, uh, the scientific uh, findings, that they have the autonomy and they don't have all these dependencies in, in their own organization. Um, and, and I think as a community, as a whole, we can also do better in that area because I always find it a bit strange that within our community, everyone is preaching about autonomous teams, self-organizing, self-managing, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's often this dependency like, well, you do need me as the expert uh, to make it work in your own organization. While I believe that teams are capable, perfectly fine to, uh, to experiment for themselves what works in their own context. Um, so just hope that as a community, we can uh, also move more in that direction. Hmm. I had to explain to my uh, my ten year old what um, the other day what a a fad was, um, and a fad again I'm not sure if that translates um, well into Dutch, but um, basically we my wife described my work as a fad, and I said, well that that fad has been around for twenty yeah. years now, my love. So <laughs> it's a real um, fad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and I had to explain to my ten year old what it meant. But I, I yeah, well, on that point, I wonder if now that that. Um, that 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 initial that tw it is 20 years of course since the manifesto was signed um and created but that event that that passion from a from a personal point of view has got us this far but i think you're right that it has to be backed up now and it has to be a lot more scientific it has to be a lot more evidence-based and it has to be um proven i think people are looking to to prove or disprove those results within their own context and you, know, you can't do that just by telling people that they should do it well, Chris, you've actually done this, haven't you? you you've done studies, um, mm -hmm. and and so I, and a lot of people will have run tests, but an, an experiment is different to a test, right? Mm -hmm. So, what what would you what would you recommend anybody if you could give them some advice to make their tests more scientifically valuable or or empirically valuable? What what would the advice be? Hmm, that's such a good question. I think there are two ways to go about this. It kind of depends on what you're trying to test. So for example, if you're interested in testing, I don't know, is estimation a good technique to use in our organization or not, then there is a lot of existing research that you can just read and, and investigate and draw conclusions from. So you don't have to necessarily do that yourself, I think. Um, you can rely on really good high quality evidence that's already there. If it's more about, uh, for example, certain features in your product, more product oriented testing that you're doing, I think it's always really important to have a control scenario where you don't change anything and that you have a scenario where you actually enable a feature or disable it or make it different or change it in one way or another. And then at least for a while, measure as objectively as you can how that's impacting the users of your product. Yeah. And then you can actually compare it um, use, usefully, it's not a perfect experiment because doing a perfect experiment is hard, even in a controlled scientific environment. But I think this already takes out a lot of bias that could be in there. Um, I think it's also important to learn at least some basic statistical techniques, not just compare numbers, but that you know what significance is and how you can calculate that. It's not hard. You just have to know how to do this. I think that that would also be very helpful for people to know a bit more about. Yeah. So I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily think everybody needs to go back to school and learn statistics <laughs> no, and, and um, that's not. but, but I think just the basic premise of control variables, dependent variables, independent variables, statistical significance, yeah. sample size, um, confirmation bias, survivorship bias, those, those factors, if you can build those into what you're doing, things will be better. And I think that would be more than 15%. Going back to our 15% solutions, that would be more than 15%. And we would be better off as a result. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And maybe to add to this, one thing that I've been thinking about recently is, um, and actually talking about with a few people as well, is it would be nice if, 
for our community, there would be an easier way to learn about scientific methodology. And I don't mean necessarily all the details, but like what is actually an experiment? What is a controlled experiment? What is um, what is a case study? What's the difference? So that you can also determine what method you need to test your hypotheses that you have about your product. I think that learning a few of those skills would, would at least be helpful. I think you're the perfect person to submit something like that to a to an upcoming conference, Chris. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. It would be it would be cool. Yeah. Cool. I was going to go, but if I can, um, uh, chaps, just go back um, to reintroduce the liberating structures um, aspect. And I was interested um, really on how some of those things, because obviously you mentioned you do some immersion workshops where you, you go through um, those techniques. Have, have, has the, um, the remote working element changed or mm. not, not changed, but perhaps surfaced? some of those structures that work better for perhaps a lot of teams or many teams won't have gone back to to face to face in person um workspaces yet is there anything that you found works really well that, that's easy to, easy to do online uh yeah um i think for the past two years i've done quite a lot of we've done quite a lot of experiments with using liberating structures online um it is different i think you cannot you can compare it, but different using liberating structures online is different than using the same liberating structures face to face. Um, I Could do you give believe, us an example? Well, um, a lot of liberating structures have to do with uh, body language, um, with the way people are sitting in a small group, the way people walk around, the way people use the physical space, uh, so to say. So body language, physical space, that that, that makes or breaks a liberating structure. Um, that's completely different in an online setting. Um, and, and it also makes it more difficult for some structures because some stru structures um, can become more mechanical uh, because then what, if you take all of that away, what's what's left is the invitation or the topic that people have a conversation about. Um, and yeah, it can still work. So I do, I do, I, I am convinced that if you do something online, liberating structures help you make the most out of it. Mm -hmm. So it will drastically improve the online experience, especially um, if you use tools like Zoom or recently Microsoft Teams also has, has this breakout room. Um, um, option because then again you can um, scale, uh, scale up and down uh, the conversations that you have um, and yeah some liberating structures were maybe not better but are easier mm -hmm. um, because what we've done is um, for example again critical uncertainties if you do it in a face-to-face -face setting um, uh, spotting the patterns across all the ideas that emerge in this exercise, it's quite difficult. Um, with an online whiteboard, uh, you just have to zoom out and then you'll see the patterns. Um, the same goes for eco-cycle planning. Um, it's a lot of fun in a face-to-face setting. Um, in a way, it's just a healthy physical exercise, um, which requires a lot of walking, etc. cetera. Um, but again, online, it's even easier. Uh, just create multiple eco-cycles zoom in and out quickly and you'll see what's there and what you can learn so it's uh yeah it, it also uh has some advantages but then again it's it's different hmm. yeah i think we both prefer the in-person version of it just because the energy in the group is so it's so cool to feel that energy that that happens when people use liberating structures especially in large groups but at the same time during the COVID lockdowns both barry and i have been in multiple conversation cafes where we had people from all over the world sitting in conversation cafes, which is one of the liberating structures. And just having that possibility to talk with anyone on the planet about a personal question with a well-structured interaction like conversation cafe, that was pretty cool, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good stuff. Yeah, very cool. good. I know, I know Paul, what Paul's about to say now. He's going to tell me we have to wrap up, Jeff. Paul is my time boxer. He is my timekeeper. Um, he is the one that manages to keep our episodes to a manageable length. Otherwise, I would be here all day. Um, That's because I've got to edit it, Jeff. I didn't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> 
so it is time and and generally the other time box that i have is that my glass is empty so mm. um, <laughs> that's that's my other way of my, my non-clock watching method of time boxing but again thank you both of you for what you've done but also for joining us today um and yeah cheers yeah, yeah. Thank you, Japs. Thank you. it was a pleasure cheers cheers